but don't worry. We have it set up to only record those of us who are unmuted and speaking in the little yellow box. So you will not be part of that recording and will not show up on the YouTube channel um, safely at home. Um, so just stay muted. And if you have any questions for any of our poets this evening, um, please put those in the chat, address those um, in the chat and we will save them up and pose them for the poets at the end of the evening. So you can stay muted the whole time. Um, and then finally, before I turn things over to Davith to get things started with the fun part of the event, um, I just wanted to thank all of you. Um, this has been a tough year um, for small businesses, for independent bookselling, um, for bookstores, for poets, for writers. Um, we couldn't do this without your continued support and it really means the world to us to have so many loyal friends and customers who have gone out of their way to shop at an independent bookstore. So thank you very, very much for that. And without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to David to get the event started. Thanks so much, Rachel. Um, well, we've got a really special poetry reading tonight uh, to conclude Poetry Month. Our good friend James Cruz has just released an amazing anthology of poems called How to Love the World, Poems of Gratitude and Hope. This collection encourages readers to use poetry to find joy daily. Naomi Shihab Nye has said that this book is for every one of us who welcomes or misses the fullness of joy and the wholeness of days. To celebrate its publication, James has pulled together a really great group of its contributors for a special poetry reading here tonight. In addition to James, we will be joined by Jane Hirschfield, Danush Lamiris, January Gill O'Neill, and Rosemary Wachola Tromer. They're going to read in alphabetical order, I think. So sit back for a lovely evening of verse, and please join me in welcoming back to Northshire, James Cruz. Well, hello everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, this is, um, I don't live in Manchester exactly, but I still think of Northshire as my hometown bookstore. And, uh, and, and it's a place where I've spent a lot of time offering workshops, browsing for books, giving readings. So um, it feels special to be doing this online for the anthology. <laughs> And um, I, I want to thank Davith and, and Rachel for all their hard work and, and pulling these readings together throughout the last year. This is not an easy thing to do. So we thank you so much for that service. Um, I also I want to thank the poets for being with me tonight. I know we're all in various time zones. <laughs> so it's different times where uh, depending on where we are. And um, so I want to thank you all for for making time to to be here with me and celebrate the anthology. So um, as David mentioned, I, I put this together this past year and a lot of folks have wondered if it was in response to the pandemic and initially it was not. I um, envisioned a, a book of poems about gratitude and joy that would just be really uplifting that would help us find um, the hard to find joy um, that, that just seemed very inexpensive the last couple of years. And then when the pandemic hit, um, hope kind of filtered into these poems as well. And so I do think of them as poems of gratitude, hope, and joy. But joy seems to be the thread for me that's running through all of these poems and, um, and the kind of guiding force behind the anthology. So what I'd like to do is um, just start off by reading a little bit of Ross Gay's foreword from um, the book. And um, I've been doing this with most of my readings. I feel like it's a sort of blessing, but it's also a reminder that um, it, we don't have to turn away from the world in order to really pause and appreciate it, um, that we don't have to focus quite so much on what's wrong because there's plenty that's wrong and that needs fixing and, um, and all of that. But I, I think he just encourages us to be more present to the beauty, the hope and the gratitude as well. So this is from Ross Gay's Forward. I have been spending a lot of time lately thinking about witness, about how witness itself is a kind of poetics or poesis which means making. By which I mean I have been wondering about how we make the world in our witnessing of it. Or maybe I have come to understand, to believe how we witness makes our world. This is why attending to what we love 
what we are astonished by, what flummoxes us with beauty is such crucial work, such rigorous work. Likewise, studying how we care and are cared for, how we tend and are tended to, how we give and are given is such necessary work. It makes the world. Witnessing how we are loved and how we love makes the world. Truth is, we are mostly too acquainted with the opposite, with the wreckage. It commands our attention and for good reason, we have to survive it. But even if we need to understand the wreckage to survive it, it needn't be the primary object of our study, the survival need be, the reaching and the holding need be, the here have this need be, the come in you can stay here need be, the let's share it all need be. So I'll stop there and um, I, it's hard for me to read that without getting choked up. Um, so I'm glad I made it through uh, this time around. And um, I also, I wanted to share um, a poem by Naomi Shihab Nye, who um, David mentioned, and who was also a great guiding force in, in this collection as well. And this is just a little poem, but I feel like it encompasses so much of what I was trying to capture with, with this book and um, really showcases her spirit as well. So I'll just read this and then I'll turn it over to the poets who have gathered today. This is Over the Weather by Naomi Shihab Nye. We forget about the spaciousness above the clouds, but it's up there. The sun's up there too. When words we hear don't fit the day, when we worry what we did or didn't do, what if we close our eyes, say any word we love that makes us feel calm, slip it into the atmosphere and rise, creamy miles of quiet, giant swoop of blue. So now I'd like to turn it over to Jane Hirschfield. Thank you so much, James, for doing this extraordinarily sustaining, supporting, perennially surprising book. And I'm honored to be reading with everybody else gathered here today. I'm going to start with the two poems of mine that are in the anthology. Um, the first one was written on March 17th, 2020. That was the first day of shelter in place in the Bay Area. And the silence and the enormity of non-doing um, was almost overwhelming. And then what happened in this poem happened. Today when I could do nothing. Today when I could do nothing, I saved an ant. It must have come in with the morning paper still being delivered to those who shelter in place. A morning paper is still an essential service. I am not an essential service. I have coffee and books, time, a garden, silence enough to fill cisterns. It must have first walked the morning paper as if loosened ink taking the shape of an ant then across the laptop computer, warm, then onto the back of a cushion. Small black ant, alone, crossing a navy cushion, moving steadily because that is what it could do. Set outside in the sun, it could not have found again its nest. What then did I save? It did not move as if it was frightened, even while walking my hand, which moved it through swiftness and air. Ant, alone, without companions, whose ant heart I could not fathom. How is your life? I wanted to ask. I lifted it, took it outside. This first day when I could do nothing, contribute nothing beyond staying distant from my own kind, I did this. 
The other poem that uh, James put in this collection is, I don't know, it's the little poem that could, because somehow when I wrote it many years ago, I simply lost it and forgot to ever put it in a book and that it continues to have a life even so, uh, always surprises me. The fish. There is a fish that stitches the inner water and the outer water together, based them with its gold bodies flowing. A heavy thread follows that transparent river, secures it, the broad world we make daily, daily give ourselves to. Neither imagined nor unimagined, neither winged nor finned, we walk the luminous seam. Not it. Flow back into the open gills. So I'm going to read you uh, two more poems, um, uh, one by me and then one from the anthology because they are connected. And you will just notice, so, so the poem of mine, I, I couldn't quite figure out which order would be best for you. So I made my best guess. And I'll start with my poem, which rather late in it, you will find a reference to um, my day being rescued by a thought from a friend. And that thought was the poem, which is in the anthology, the friend Dorian Locks. So anyhow, I wrote this on New Year's Day this year. Um, I always try to write a poem New Year's Day. And I woke up just trying to take stock of everything, not only the pandemic, but the last five years. And so um, this is what came. And you will see I was bewildered. Um, it makes reference to the fact that for the entire four years of the last um, what happened, I took some political action every single day. Um, so counting this New Year's morning, what powers yet remain to me? The world asks, as it asks daily, and what can you make, can you do to change my deep, broken, fractured? I count this first day of another year, what remains? I have a mountain, a kitchen, two hands, can admire with two eyes the mountain, actual, recalcitrant, shuffling its pebbles, sheltering foxes and beetles can make black-eyed peas and collards, can make from last year's late ripening persimmons footing, can climb a stepladder, change the bulb in a track light. For four years, I woke each day, first to the mountain, then to the question. The feet of the new sufferings followed the feet of the old, and still they surprised. I brought salt, brought oil to the question, brought sweet tea, brought postcards and stamps for four years each day, something. Stone did not become apple, war did not become peace, yet joy still stays joy, sequins stay sequins, words still bespangle, bewilder. Today I woke without answer, the day answers, and pockets a thought from a friend. Don't despair of this falling world. Not yet. Didn't it give you the asking? So here to close uh, the poem of Dorian's. It's also in a lovely little limited edition chapbook called Salt, which is what I read it in that morning. In any event, if we are fractured, we are fractured like stars bred to shine in every direction, through any dimension, billions of years since and hence. I shall not lament the human, not yet. There is something more to come, our hearts a gold mine not yet plumbed, an uncharted sea. Nothing is gone forever. If we came from dust and will return to dust, then we can find our way into anything. What we are capable of is not yet known, and I praise us now in advance. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Jane, for that beautiful reading. Uh, just savoring it. And I was thinking as I was sitting here holding the book and reading along a bit that I'm not a book designer, but if I were, I might design a book just this size <laughs> and on just this lovely paper. For those of you who, who have it, it just fits sort of right in a large jacket pocket or in a little bag, which I love about it so much. And it's made me think also about how pleasure tends to live in very small places and very particular places. So while we find such overwhelm in the greater world, we often find pleasure sort of in the pockets of our lives. And so I'd like to start with a tiny pocket poem as a kind of invocation. It's not in this volume, but then I'll pivot to ones that are. And I wrote this actually for the New York Public Library because they commission pocket poems to send home with people. And this is called The Heart Is Not. The heart is not a pocket, a thing that can be turned inside out by anybody's hand not a place for pebbles or loose change, not to carry old receipts. It does not tear at the seam. It does not have a seam. It cannot be torn. So a pocket-sized poem there. And then I'd love to read um, a couple of poems from the anthology as well. Um, and I think I'll start with Improvement, which is a poem I wrote for my eye doctor, as you do. <laughs> Improvement. The optometrist says my eyes are getting better each year. Soon he'll have to lower my prescription. What's next? The light step I had at six all the gray hairs back to brown, skin taut as a drum. My improved eyes and I walked around town and celebrated. We took in the letters of the marquee, the individual leaves filling out the branches of the sycamore, an early moon. So much goes downhill joints wearing out with every mile, the delicate folds of the eardrum exhausted from years of listening. I'm grateful for small victories. The way the heart still beats time in the cathedral of the ribs and the mind watching its parade of thoughts enter and leave begins to see them for what they are jugglers, fire swallowers, acrobats tossing their batons into the air. I, I'm just remembering that I was, I competed in a poetry event, if that's possible. Poetry baseball is something we have out here on the West Coast. And the audience throws you prompts and you're supposed to read one of your poems that relates to that prompt or change the poem in the moment so that it does. Jane's probably nodding. She's probably been involved in that or seen it or <laughs> being out here. <laughs> um, but after I read that, they said, oh, you should have come last year. The prompt was tossing batons. <laughs> what are the chances? And I missed my chance. <laughs> anyway, that just popped into my head while reading it. But I'll read another one of mine and then I'd like to um, read one by William Stafford. I had actually marked that same Dorian one with the fracturedness and the stars, but there's so many wonderful poems to read here. And this one is called Goldfinches. I live out on some acreage here in Santa Cruz and my winter sort of fall to winter entertainment <clears throat> is looking at the persimmon tree out the living room window where it all goes down. Everything happens in that tree. Goldfinches. Good luck, they say, to see one. 
its face and breast pure citrus against the gray sky. And today I am twice blessed because two such birds grace the low boughs of the persimmon, eating the soft heart of winter's fruit, though they will also feast on thistles pulled from the dry flowers, and so are said to eat the thorns of Christ's crown, to lift some small measure of his suffering. Whatever your grief, however long you've carried it, may something come to you, quick and unexpected, whisk away the bristled edge in its sharp and tender beak. And from Stafford, I'd love to share his poem, Any Morning. And for those of you reading along, I should have been doing this as I was going, but it's on page 92. So for those of you who already have the book, sometimes it's nice to read along as we go. Any Morning. Just lying on the couch and being happy, only humming a little, the quiet sound in the head Trouble is busy elsewhere at the moment. It has so much to do in the world. People who might judge are mostly asleep. They can't monitor you all the time, and sometimes they forget. When dawn flows over the hedge, you can get up and act, act busy. Little corners like this, pieces of heaven, left lying around can be picked up and saved. People won't even see that you have them. They are so light and easy to hide. Later in the day, you can act like the others. You can shake your head. You can frown. <laughs> Thank you all. That was lovely. I'm just, I'm enjoying sitting here and listening to, uh, and just being in the company of some wonderful poets. So thank you, uh, James, for pulling us all together and this wonderful anthology, which I don't know if anybody's hold, held that, but I'm just gonna do it because the cover is amazing. Uh, so I'm gonna read, I, have, I think I have two, two poems in the anthology, so I'll read my two and um, maybe two more after that. Um, this poem uh, I wrote uh, at, while I was going through a very difficult time. And, you know, sometimes you just need a girlfriend to tell you what's up. And so this is for my friend, Colleen. In the company of women, make me laugh over coffee, make it a double, make it frothy so it seeds in our delight. Make my cup overflow with your small happiness. I want to hoot and snort and cackle and chuckle. Let your laughter fill me like a bell. Let me listen to your ringing and singing as Billie Holiday croons above our heads. Sorry, the blues are nowhere to be found. Not tonight, not here. No makeup, no tears, only contours, only curves. Each sip takes back a pound. Each dry roasted swirl takes our soul. Can I have a refill, just one more? Let the bitterness sink to the bottom of our lives. Let us take this joy to go. And the other one that's in the anthology is one that I wrote for my son, and if I were to turn my camera around, he's asleep on the couch next to me. That's what you get with a teenager. But this poem, um, you know, sometimes poems seem relevant and, and, you know, I wish this poem didn't feel so relevant these days, but. Hoodie. A gray hoodie will not protect my son from the rain, from the New England cold, I see the partial eclipse of his face 
as his head sinks into the half dark and shades his eyes. Even in our quiet suburb with its unlocked doors, I fear for his safety. The darkest child on our street in the empire of blocks. Sometimes I do not know who he is anymore, traveling the back roads between boy and man. He strides a deep stride, pounds a basketball into wet pavement. Will he take his shot or is he waiting for the open mouth orange rim to take a chance on him? I sing his name to the night, ask for safe passage from this borrowed body into the next and wonder who could mistake him for anything but good. And so I will thank you. I'll read one of mine uh, and another of mine and then uh, another one from the anthology. And so this one actually picks up a little bit of the title of the book, coincidentally. How to Love. After stepping into the world again, there is that question of how to love, how to bundle yourself against the frosted morning, the crunch of icy grass underfoot, the scrape of cold wipers along the windshield and convert time into distance. What song to sing down an empty road as you begin your morning commute? And is there enough in you to see, really see the three wild turkeys crossing the street with their featherless heads and stilt light legs in search of a morning meal? Nothing to do but hunker down, wait for them to safely cross. As they amble away, you wonder if they want to be startled back into this world. Maybe you do too, waiting for all this to give way to love itself, to look into the eyes of another and feel something the pleasure of a new lover in the unbroken night, your wings folded around him on the other side of this ragged January as if a long sleep has ended. And I will just close by uh, reading a poem that I actually taught in class uh, this week. Uh, it's Ellen Bass's poem, Any Common Desolation. Any common desolation can be enough to make you look up at the yellowed leaves of the apple tree, the few that survived the, the rains and frost, shot with late afternoon sun. They glow a deep orange gold against a blue so sheer, a single bird would rip it like silk. You may have to break your heart, but it isn't nothing to know even one moment alive the sound of an oar in an oar lock or a ruminant animal tearing grass, the smell of grated ginger, the ruby neon of the liquor store sign, warm socks. You remember your mother, her precision a ceremony as she gathered the white cotton, slipped it over your toes, drew up the heel, turned the cuff. A breath can uncoil as you walk across your own muddy yard, the Big Dipper pouring night down over you and everything you dread, all you can't bear, dissolves and like a needle slipped into your vein, that sudden rush of the world. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I tell you, it's pretty easy to, to be part of a poetry reading about gratitude and feel an overwhelming flood of gratitude. Um, this is exactly how to love the world. What a great example of how to do it. And, uh, and just looking at everybody's pictures, I, it's fun to look at people's pictures on Zoom and look at people and just kind of think, I love you. I am so grateful for you. I don't know if any of you are doing that right now, but you could just look at everybody's beautiful picture as we're here in this strange ephemeral space together and think, wow, thank you. Thank you for showing up. 
one of the people I saw, although I don't see his name here anymore, but it's my dear friend, Jack Riddle, who uh, has also a poem in this book. And I'll start with his poem, After Spending the Morning Baking Bread. Our cat lies across the stove's front burner's right leg hanging over the oven door. He is looking into the pantry where his bowl sits full on the counter. His smaller dish, the one for his splash of cream, sits empty. Say yes to wanting to be this cat. Say yes to wanting to lie across the leftover warmth, letting it rise into your soft belly, spreading into every twitch of whisker, twist of fur and cell through the Mobius strip of your bloodstream. You won't know you will die. You won't know the mice do not exist for you. If a lap is empty and warm, you will land on it. Feel an unsteady hand along your back, fingers scratching behind your ear. You will purr. Oh, I love that poem. I want to thank James so much for putting together this anthology and for doing it at such an important time as if it isn't always an important time, but wow, we needed it now. And I also want to thank the folks from Northshire Books for creating this space for us to be together. This, um, I was really glad to hear January read the poem for her teenage boy. I have one too. And wow, it's such a crazy workout. I had no idea what I was signing up for. And that's a little bit about uh, this poem. If you're reading along, it's on page 16. This is 15 years later, I see how it went. They say, you fall in love with your child the moment you first hold them, still covered in blood and vernix. I held the strange being just arrived from the womb and I felt Curious, astonished, humbled, nervous, but love didn't come till later. Came from holding him while he was screaming for a year. <laughs> Waking with him when I wanted to sleep. Bouncing him when I wanted to be still. Love grew as my ideas of myself diminished. Love grew as he came into himself. Love grew as I learned to let go of what I had been told and learn to trust the emerging form, falling in love with the flawed beings we are. Until I couldn't imagine being without him until I was the one being born. Um, <laughs> I have to say that, you know, even when I wrote that poem a year or so ago, I had no idea how much harder it would be the next year. <laughs> but um, yeah, as January says, the back roads between boy and man, and uh, wow, this is some crazy terrain to, I need a little hope and, uh, gratitude to get me through this time. This is uh, how it might continue. It's on page 94. I've certainly been accused of um, being exuberant before. And uh, yeah, this is, <laughs> this is part of that uh, collection of a little extreme exuberance and also part of my obsession with punctuation. I have poems about semicolons and ellipses and question marks and commas. And here we have the exclamation mark, how it might continue. Wherever we go, the chance for joy, whole orchards of amazement. One more reason to always travel with our pockets full of exclamation marks. So we might scatter them for others like apple seeds. Some will dry out, some will blow away, but some will take 
root and grow exuberant groves filled with long thin fruits that resemble one hand clapping. So much enthusiasm as they flutter back and forth. And although nothing's heard and though nothing's really changed, people everywhere for years to come will swear that the world is filled with ripe applause will fill their own pockets with new seeds to scatter. There's Danusha's pockets. <laughs> what did she say? I wrote it down. I just loved what you said. We find pleasure in the pockets of our lives. <laughs> Thank you for that. And um, I'll close with this poem uh, that I wrote oh, sometime in the last year. Um, you know, sometimes hope, <laughs> It's like hope gets a flat tire. And what do you do then? Um, you start walking, you start making a choice to, to show up differently. And I think that, that gratitude, that hope are not so much a what, even so they're nouns, but they're a how. It is how do we meet this world over and over? I think there may be less a given and more of a choice that we make. Um, as Jane said in, in one of her poems, what can we do? What can we do? Morning after. Again, the chance to praise the same room, the same floor, the same view, the same tea the same image in the same mirror, which is today startlingly not the same. Again, the chance to find the miracle in the leaves that fall, the miracle in the morning sun, the miracle in the willows beside the pond. Again, the chance to fall in love with the same sky, the same field, the same dirt, the same broken world. Again, the chance to show up with these same tired arms and put them to work. The same work as yesterday, which is to learn to lift up, to heal, to carry, to build, to be in the world, to praise the same room, the same floor, the same view the same tea. Thanks friends. Thanks James. Thank you all so much. This has been such a wonderful uh, space and evening. Um, and so please audience, if you have any questions, type them in the chat. Um, but I've got one I'd like to kick things off with. Uh, James, I've, I've hosted you for a couple of these um, anthologies of poetry now. Could you uh, tell us a little bit about how you, you choose to, to put these together when you're editing it? Oh, sure. Um, well, I, I, I guess I'll give a more circuitous answer because I feel like the anthologies choose me. Um, you know, that I don't, I don't really set out knowing exactly what I'm doing. Um, the first one was of kindness and connection and um, and it just felt like, I guess I'm trying to bring into the culture whatever seems to be missing at the time or whatever I'm feeling is missing. And um, certainly when I started putting that together, it was right after um, the last presidential uh, inauguration in 2017. And um, it just felt like kindness was missing so much from the national world conversation. And um, you know, I see the world through the lens of poetry, so I felt like I could do my own small part in hopefully contributing to um, bringing a little more kindness and uh, connection into the world. And then with this one, um, I really just, I, I think I'm also putting together the books that I most need to read. So it's kind of a selfish act in a way. Um, I needed more gratitude and joy, especially after, you know, four years of, you know, what Jane said, what happened. Um, after four years of that, or almost four years, I, I just needed, um, I needed permission to feel joy and to find joy to, 
you know, do what I can to change and improve the world, but at the same time to um, be grateful for those small victories, um, as Danusha says in her poem, um, and just find those small moments. You know, I think what people, what I'm hearing from people who have already picked up this book is that it's allowing them to appreciate more of the small moments and to really maybe see um, their immediate surroundings just a little differently and, you know, to, to change how they see things, which is just what Rosemary was saying. Thank you, James. There's um, a question here that I, I got um, from the audience member, Nichol, who's for each of our poets tonight, which is to ask you what you're reading now uh, at this time. Sure, so I can I can start. I, I actually just picked up a novel called Dear Edward, and it's about a um, young boy who is the sole survivor of a plane crash where his family passed away. And so far, it's, it's really fascinating. And I have to say, I was drawn to it because um, the epigraph is from Pema Chodron, one of my favorite Buddhist teachers. And it's um, because death is certain and the time of death is uncertain, what's important. So that's what I'm reading. There we go. I am rereading a almost unknown translation of poems by a Turkish poet, Edip Chansever, I think I'm pronouncing correctly, translated by Richard Tillinghast and his daughter. Um, I wanted an infusion of the slightly surreal and many of Chansever's poems hold that. And then I can tell you the book I'm about to read, which I know nothing about except that it was recommended to me, um, a book called Metazoa, uh, by the same uh, biological philosopher who wrote uh, one, of the, one of the great octopus books, Other Minds. And my friend Alison Gopnik said, I must read it. So I'm about to start reading it. But since I haven't even opened the first page, I can't say a word about it. <laughs> uh, I can name a book I've just started as of yesterday, but made some good headway into which is or it was the day before yesterday okay two days in which is Kwame Dawes's new book Nebraska and I was just interested in hearing about a Caribbean person like the people in my family some of the people in my family living in Nebraska um, I made a friend a Caribbean friend in, in my town here because I noticed she looked very cold <laughs> it's not even that cold here so I went up and talked to her and yes, it turned out she was from Barbados. So anyway, the thought of Caribbean people living in cold places and it's a beautifully written, really understated book. So I'm enjoying it. Um, so for April, I've been writing a poem a day. Uh, and oh my goodness, thank, thank, thank you that the month is almost over. Um, but I have been, uh, so I decided to do with a few friends of mine, American sonnets. So 14 lines unrhymed um, with a volta or a turn in the mill. So I have been rereading Terrence Hayes's um, American sonnets for my past and future assassin and Diane Seuss's new book, Frank, uh, like 130 sonnets in that book. So between the two, you know, we've been, uh, my group and I have been trying sonnets. Um, and when I'm not doing that or grading papers, uh, I am reading Natasha Trethway's, um, uh, her um, memoir and trying to finish that up. It's a, it's, a, it's a terrific read. All right, so I've been debating if I should tell you what I'm really reading or just <laughs> tell you what it's gonna be. Um, really, I'm writing, um, I'm writing a romance series right now. So I've been reading Seriously, I'm embarrassed to say if you could see my Kindle, you would really wonder about me, but I'm hundreds, I'm reading hundreds of romance books. Um, I, I really understand the genre at this point. 
And, um, <laughs> and in addition, uh, I have to say that I am loving Danusha's most recent book, which is Bonfire Opera. And I read, I do have probably 15, 16, 17 books of poems open right now so that I I couldn't say that I'm reading them. Like I sit down and dedicate time to them. It's more that I, I pick them up and open them to whatever page shows up and let that be the, the poem of the moment. But Danusha's book keeps rising to the top and it's gloriously sensual and um, her metaphors just kind of floor me and thrill me and, and make me throw up my arms and say, oh, so I can highly recommend that book. Thanks, Rosemary. Um, actually, we had a wonderful event just last night with three romance writers, uh, Sanithia Williams, uh, Mona Shroff, and Naima Simone. So uh, nothing, no shame there. Um, I, we're, we haven't gotten any more questions, so I think maybe, um, James, if you could maybe read us a couple of more poems and take us out for this evening, and we could end with a little more poetry. Sure, I'd be happy to do so. Um, so I think I'll read um, one of my poems that's in the book, and then maybe one more. And um, this one is called Down to Earth, feels appropriate because it's raining right now. But uh, this poem is about just watching the way my husband, who is a farmer, interacts with the natural world. And, and it's such a beautiful thing. It, I, I envy his connection because I don't have quite the same connection to nature, though I'm trying. So this is called Down to Earth. The heart of a farmer is made of muscle and clay that aches for return to earth. And when the sky releases a steady rain, massaging each row of sprouted beans, my husband leans out of the car window and opens his hand to hold that water for a single instant. His heart now beating in sync with rain, seeping through layers to kiss the roots of every plant alive on this living, breathing planet on whose back we were granted permission to live for a limited time. And then, um, let's see. Sometimes I wish I had organized this by alphabetical order because it's easier to find poems, but instead I did it intuitively so that the poems would uh, speak to each other. And um, so I think the last poem that I'd like to share is um, by Catherine Williams. I, I feel like this poem captures for me just the movement of days throughout the pandemic and um, features a dog at the same time. So this is The Dog Body of My Soul by Catherine Williams. Some days I feel like a retriever racing back and forth, fetching the tired old balls the universe tosses me. Some days I'm on a leash, following someone else's route, sensing I'm supposed to be grateful. Some days I'm waiting in a darkened house, bladder insistent, not knowing when my people will return. But some days I hurl myself into the sweet stinging surf, race wildly back and roll in the sands, warm welcome. So I want to thank all the poets for joining us tonight. Thanks again to Northshire Bookstore in both Saratoga and Manchester for hosting us tonight. It's been such a pleasure. I feel so filled after this night of poetry. James, I wonder if you'd take just a moment to share about the upcoming offering that we have with okay. you and me and Jane and others. Yeah, so Danusha and I are actually going to be offering a webinar this summer called The Poetry of Resilience. And um, I believe the website is thepoetryofresilience.com. And um, Jane is going to be one of our special guests. And we're just going to be talking about craft, uh, poetry, offering prompts, and 
you know, we, we both keep mm -hmm. saying that this is the year to do things you love with people you love. And um, so we're just both trying to do more of that. So um, our other guests will be folks like Ellen Bass, Ross Gay, Dorian Lux, many of whom are, are in this anthology. And uh, someone says she signed up already, Danusha. So there you go. <laughs> I just saw that. <laughs> and I've shared the link there too in the chat if people would like to know more about that. Yeah, we're just, we're so grateful and so excited to be offering that. So um, if you're interested at all, you're welcome to um, get in touch, but you should find all the info on that link. And actually to that end, we're hosting January on Stubborn Praise. And that's coming up, I think, May 11th? No, in June. In June, we, on May 11th, we have uh, Mark Nepo and then January and June. That'll be so wonderful. And I don't, I don't have a website. You can go to my website. I know it's on my website for more information. Um, you can go to rosemary.com. That's R-O-S-E-M-E-R-R-Y. Merry Christmas, rosemary.com. All right. Well, thanks again, everyone. And uh, Rachel, did you want to say something? I, I just wanted to thank all of you for, for creating this lovely evening. It really was magical and very much a bomb for me, something that I needed and didn't even know how much I needed. So thank you for that. Um, thank you, audience, for being here, for sharing this space with us. Um, please come back on May 11th. We're hosting another wonderful poetry reading with Jules Gibbs and Rachel Eliza Griffiths. Um, Rachel Eliza Griffiths is actually a repeat guest. She was here um, this past fall celebrating her amazing collection, Seeing the Body, and that uh, she's an incredible poet and reader. So that's really worth your time if you're free. Um, and if you haven't done so already, you can order um, tonight's book at northshire.com. And thank you again, everyone, for your support and for being here.